Thank you all for coming to the gala. We are virtual once again, but that means we can share this experience with disability community members and allies from across the country and around the world who usually wouldn't be able to attend in person. I'm Hari Srinivasan. I'm a minimally speaking autistic, which means that while I can repeat or say words and phrases for a few of my basic wants, I need to use some form of communication technology for expressing most thoughts beyond those. I also have a co-diagnosis of ADHD along with oral motor apraxia, body schema, social anxiety etc. It sure is a long list. The computerized voice you are hearing is a text-to-speech software on my laptop that uses the Ryan voice, with an American accent male voice. Yes, it allows me to communicate but also comes with downsides. Communication technology is still not intuitive to use for many of us, with oral motor apraxia challenges. It is critical that the otherwise fast-moving technology advances pay attention to this area as well. Other issues are affordability, and there are limited natural-sounding voices. When my buddy David and I communicate for instance, it sounds like Ryan speaking to Ryan, a kind of loss of our individual identity. Continuing with my introduction, I'm a student at UC Berkeley. Major in psychology and minor in disability studies. This year I'm doing my own independent research on the autistic experience of the emotion of all, which I hope will lead to potential applications. Fingers crossed that grad school is in the cards for me next year. I'm also vice chair of the USN board and on the Interagency Autism Coordinating Committee amongst other things. I'm active in the autism advocacy space in my own non-traditional way, both on and off campus in many different ways. I like to think of everything I get to do as small pebbles that will widen the ripple in the pond of change. I want to include an image description here as that is an important accessibility feature. I'm a young college-going male of South Asian ancestry with brown skin, wearing a blue sweatshirt and a blue and yellow cap. My mask has the words, Cal, Zero Waste, Reusables, Not Disposable on it. I also want to appreciate and acknowledge how hard the sensory part of wearing a mask is, for some of us autistics. On Fridays, this semester, for instance, I have back-to-back -back classes from noon to five which also means I wear a mask from noon to five on Fridays, which has been challenging. The words, not disposable, on my mask, are also ironically appropriate in the disability context, as people with disabilities have historically been seen as disposable people. My Zoom background image is the main Sproul Plaza on the Berkeley campus, with buildings, structures, trees, the clock tower, and some students walking around. Just to my right, just outside of the picture window is where our DSP, or Disabled Students Program Office is located. This is the first ever DSP, established by Ed Roberts in 1970, and became the model for other universities. Pivoting back to more recent events, what a year it's been. We have faced so much, and we are so happy to see you all here. As it is. Handling uncertainty is hard for many autistics, even in the pre-pandemic world. The pandemic certainly felt like the ultimate uncertainty. The pandemic has brought to light disparities faced by people with developmental disabilities. It has also compelled us to come up with creative and even unusual workarounds to reveal unexpected silver linings. For example, hybrid employment with a large component of remote work could well be one of the solutions for the future of autistic employment. Before continuing, we want to thank the generous support of the sponsors for this event. I want to especially thank our gold sponsor this year, Anthem, for sponsoring our film screenings. You can see this year's silver and bronze sponsors on the screen now as well as all the other sponsors in program. Our theme this year is hashtag, all aboard. We love trains here at Dawson, and we are using them as a model for our advocacy. 
we persevere, and we keep moving forward, because advocacy doesn't stop, except at designated stops. We bring more people on board, and we learn how to change our advocacy and do better. We don't let up, we find new ways to do our advocacy, and to bring everyone with us. Because that's the point, all means all. When we look back on all that Austin has done together this year, there's a lot to be proud of. Austin has created a number of new resources and toolkits that our community needs, such as a self-advocate's guide to manage long-term supports and services. Who's in control? Control over community services for people with disabilities. One idea per line. A guide to making easy read resources and sharing your story for a political purpose. Because our stories deserve to be heard. Austin continued to fight for the needs of the disability community to be included in COVID relief legislation. Austin worked with our grassroots to urge Congress to include funding for home and community-based services in COVID-19 relief legislation. Austin also continued to create cognitively accessible resources about COVID-19. We are still fighting for bans on organ transplant discrimination, seclusion and restraint, sheltered workshops, and other practices that harm disabled people. Awesome doesn't do this work alone. In February, as part of a national coalition of civil rights groups and legal scholars, Awesome released a new report, examining how crisis standards of care, may lead to intersectional medical discrimination against COVID-19 patients. Austin partnered with the National Partnership for Women and Families to produce, access, autonomy, and dignity, a series on reproductive rights and disability justice. Austin signed on to a letter to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, calling on them to implement guidance and provide technical assistance to help states develop police-free mobile crisis response programs that are equitable, safe, and effective. Every year Austin signs on to hundreds of demands for action and legislation as part of our coalition work. And we welcome the positive changes when they come. We've been fighting for years against adding work requirements to Medicaid. Work requirements would have tied the ability to receive Medicaid benefits to the ability to work. We know that work requirements are cruel, ineffective, and unnecessary. This year, we welcomed the defeat of Medicaid work requirements. And after more than a decade of unjust prosecution and abuse in the criminal justice system, Nellie Latson, a black man with multiple disabilities, was finally granted a full pardon by Virginia Governor, Ralph Northam. Both Essen and our grassroots has been seeking justice for Mr. Latson since 2014. Check out Essen's annual report for more information about all of the work we've been doing this year. Thank you all for being here and supporting Essen. Essen needs our help all year round so please give if you are able. Let's flap laws. This is what all of the guests usually do at Austin's annual gala, instead of applause, since many autistic people are sensitive to loud noises. Flap laws originated in the American deaf community as a visual alternative to noise-based clapping. You are welcome to flap applause along with us at home, or in the chat when we announce this year's awardees. Let's flap laws. Our hashtag is hashtag, Austin Gala. Feel free to tweet virtual gala selfies, or congrats to our awardees, to the hashtag. You can also participate in the Twitter chat, on Friday on Civic Engagement. Before the award ceremony begins, we're going to go over the schedule for Austin's annual gala. I'll turn it over to Austin staff who will explain the schedule. Thank you so much to Hari Srinivasan, our Master of Ceremonies, joining me in a round of virtual flap laws for Hari. I'm here to quickly go over the schedule for this year's virtual gala with you. The schedule is also available in your gala program and on ASAN's website. We're currently in the middle of our welcome remarks. Then at 7 p.m. Eastern tonight, we begin our film screening. 
Tonight we'll be screaming, listen, and people like me. You'll be able to play and pause the video on your own, and you can find the links in your program on ASAN's gala page, and we will tweet them out at oddselfadvocacy. Feel free to join the discussion on Twitter and Facebook using the hashtag ASANGala hashtag. Tomorrow, Thursday the 18th, we begin at 3 p.m. Eastern Time with our first panel on racial disparities in public health. We'll hear from Shivangi Agarwal, Hector Manuel Ramirez, and Ryan Easterly. This panel will be hosted on Zoom and streamed live to YouTube. Go to autisticadvocacy.org slash panel1 to access this panel, and again the link is in your program and we will tweet it out. There will be cart transcription for all our panels. At 5 p.m. Eastern tomorrow we will hold our second film screening of the film This Is Not About Me. Again, you'll be able to play and pause the film on your own time, but please note This Is Not About Me is only available tomorrow from 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern Time, so make sure to catch it while you can. Again, you can find the link in your program and we will be tweeting it out. At 7 p.m. Eastern tomorrow, we will follow our second film screening with a panel on centering AAC users in film, featuring Morak Sedgwick, DJ Savarese, Juan Duong, Isaiah Tian Gruel, and Jordan Zimmerman. This is a pre-recorded captioned panel that will stream on YouTube and at autisticadvocacy.org slash panel two. Then Thursday's programming ends. On Friday the 19th, we will begin at 2 p.m. Eastern with our third panel, Racial Disparities in Community Living, where we'll hear from panelists Valerie Novak, Galila Selassie, and Lucina Kaye. This panel will be held live on Zoom and streamed to our YouTube channel and can be accessed at autisticadvocacy.org slash panel three. At 4 p.m. Eastern Time on Friday, join us for our civic engagement Twitter chat. We'll post questions to respond to on our Twitter at OddSelfAdvocacy, and please join in using hashtag ASANGala. Finally, at 6 p.m. on Friday, we'll have our closing ceremony and remarks from our executive director, Julia Bascom. These will be streamed on ASAN's YouTube channel, just like the opening ceremony. Please make sure to join us. With that, we'll close out our three days of celebration. Again, all the links I just mentioned can be found on the GALA page on ASAN's website, in your GALA program, or on our social media. Thank you so much for joining us for our 2021 GALA. Now, we were so excited to hear briefly from Alison Barkoff, the Acting Administrator and Assistant Secretary for Aging of the Administration for Community Living. Alison was honored to give Alison the Ally of the Year Award at our 2017 gala, and we are happy to have her back. Hello, it's such a pleasure to speak with you all at the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network's 2021 annual gala. My name is Allison Barkoff. I'm the Principal Deputy Administrator at the Administration for Community Living, and I'm currently serving as the Acting Administrator. Let me start with a visual description. I'm a middle-aged white woman with medium length brown curly hair. I'm wearing a blue blouse with flowers and I have a white background with the ACL and HHS logos behind me. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. Before I go further, I wanna start by saying thank you to each and every one of you for your incredible advocacy throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. You've worked to prevent discrimination and accessing life-saving COVID treatment, help people remain in the community and out of high-risk institutional settings, fought for the rights of disabled students, and helped address barriers people face in accessing vaccines. Your voices have been heard by states that were using crisis standards of care and by Congress on the urgent need for emergency funding for home and community-based services. At the Administration for Community Living, we've relied on ASAN for the incredible plain language resources that you've made publicly available throughout the pandemic. We've promoted these resources on our webpage, shared them with federal partners, and shared them on listservs and social media. Your tireless efforts have literally saved lives and supported so many people. Thank you is not enough. And now we're on the cusp of historic investments in longtime priorities for the disability community through the Build Back Better Act. Billions of dollars to expand home and community-based services, permanently reauthorize Money Falls the Person program, 
expand opportunities for competitive integrated employment and eliminate subminimum wages for workers with disabilities and to strengthen the direct support professional workforce. <coughs> None of this would be possible without your work to educate policymakers and to share your own powerful stories. For those of you who don't know me well, let me quickly start by saying that 40 years ago, I joined the disability community as a sibling of a brother with an intellectual disability in a world where we were told that the only place for him was in an institution. Advocating alongside my brother and other self-advocates, families and disability advocates from across the country, we fought together to expand community services and to help create a world where all people with disabilities have opportunities to live, work, and fully participate in their communities and to make choices for themselves about the life they want to live. My brother now lives in an apartment with a roommate of his choice, has a great job where he's a valued employee, has a girlfriend and an active social life, and is a strong self-advocate an advocate for disability rights, including as a member of the Georgia Council on Developmental Disabilities. When I joined the Administration for Community Living on Inauguration Day, I was honored to know that I would have the privilege of partnering with self-advocates from across the country. During your gala, I know that you will announce award winners in various categories. I want to congratulate all of the winters, winners for your contributions to autistic self-advocacy. Your mantra, nothing about us without us, will always be respected by this administration and we will always keep our stakeholders centered in everything we do. ACL has the important responsibility within HHS and the federal government of being an advocate and voice on disability issues. But our voice only rings true when we listen to our stakeholders when we hear from self-advocates, and when we learn from real world and lived experience. I applaud ASAN for being an organization that supports and centers self-advocacy among autistic and other disabled people, and for so effectively using your voices and combining them into messages that truly impact policies. Because of your work, autistic and other disabled people are stronger. Families are stronger, communities are stronger, and our nation is stronger. I want to end where I started with a thank you for your incredible advocacy, particularly over the last 18 months. Our community has been devastated by COVID in so many ways, and you have kept up your life-saving advocacy while at the same time dealing with personal challenges and heartbreaking tragedies. Your tireless work to build coalitions and educate policymakers about what our community needs has been so impactful. And ASAN and its members are one reason we are on the cusp of advancing so many of our community's longstanding goals. Thank you for this opportunity to say a few words and to be part of your gala. ACL and I personally look forward to our continued collaboration towards making community living and self-determination a reality for all people with disabilities. Thank you. Now we will begin the awards ceremony. Austin's awards seek to recognize people who work to advance the self-advocacy movement. The self-advocacy movement is fighting battles in many different places around the U.S. and the world, in many different venues from the halls of power to media and public opinion. All of these awardees are doing vital work. I'll turn it over to Austin staff, who will present the awards. Hello, my name is Noor Purves. I am the Community Engagement Manager here at ASAN. I am so proud to present a service to the Self-Advocacy Movement Award to the team at Ask Me, I'm an AAC user. Ask Me, I'm an AAC user is a group where AAC users are the authority on AAC. 
and it is a place where AAC users, speech-language practitioners, support staff, doctors, parents, families, and others who are interested in AAC can ask questions and get advice and insight from actual AAC users. In this group, all AAC use and need is valid, and AAC users range from part-time to full-time, and the type of AAC varies between each user. AAC access and use is a basic communication right, and everyone should be able to use and access AAC regardless of perceived speech capabilities. I am so honored to present this award to Ask Me, I'm an AAC user team, Sirsha Tilton, Stephanie Fuller, Alyssa Hillary Zisk, Emery Arden, Ange Sipka, and Jupiter Tatiana Rose. Congratulations on all of your hard work, and I am so proud to present you with this award. Thank you. We would like to thank ASAN and others who have recognized the importance of prioritizing the voices of AAC users while discussing AAC. We moderate a group about Augmentative and Alternative Communication, or AAC for short. AAC describes all the ways people communicate, other than oral speech, or mouth words, and we're feeling tongue-in-cheek. Ask me, I oh man, AAC user is different from other groups about AAC because we insist that AAC users are the authority on AAC. Sisha noticed several years ago that in other AAC groups, AAC users are not given priority as the experts in our own experiences. Instead, all the discussion, questions, and answers were dominated by parents teachers, therapists and SLPs while actual users' voices were drowned out. Because Sisha was being tired of this she ended up asking me why there was nowhere that AAC users were given a priority. Sisha, Alyssa, and I had already been a part of a group called Ask Me, I'm Autistic, for several years by this point. This group had a rule about only allowing autistic people to answer for 24 hours. Sisha asked me about making Ask Me, I oh Man, AAC user, a thing, and so we started the group. We never expected Ask Me, I'm an AAC user, to grow to its current size. New moderators have joined us, as we have grown. Emery. Ange, and Jupiter. All of our moderators are AAC users. This is the choice we have explicitly made in order to have AAC users be in charge. We prioritize AAC user voices by requiring that anyone who isn't an AAC user wait 24 hours after a new post is made before commenting. Only AAC users are allowed to comment during this time. Our goal is to ensure that AAC users have a place to not just be the official voice on AAC, but to have a chance to engage with each other, share experience, tips, and tricks, support each other and have a community. We also would like to ensure families, teachers, and SLPS hear first-hand perspectives from AAC users on what works and what doesn't so that future AAC users can grow up better supported. Overall, we would like to ensure that access to AAC, AAC use, and communication rights are treated as necessities, not as an inconvenience or last resort. We moderate a small corner of the internet where AAC users' voices are heard and prioritized, in the hope that one day AAC users can be the center of our own stories and seen as the experts in our own experiences and communication. We would like to thank all the AAC users and ask me, I'm an AAC user. Giving advice and educating parents and professionals is hard self-advocacy work. This hard work helps us support each other and it helps us support future generations of AAC users.
For both current and future AAC users, communication access will help them advocate for themselves in ways more people can understand. Our hope is that one day a group like this won't be necessary, because AAC users will always be given the chance to speak about themselves and their experiences. We hope that AAC users will in the future not be spoken over, and we won't need to say that AAC users have priority. We also hope that eventually everyone will have access to the best ways to communicate for themselves. We hope that right now, providing this place where AAC users can advocate for themselves and future generations, helps to make ourselves unnecessary in the future. Thank you. I am proud to present one of two awards for service to the self-advocacy movement to Misa Rebaro Tipico. Misa Rebaro Tipico is a group run by and for autistic people. Their goal is to promote the principles of the disability rights movement regarding autism in the Spanish-speaking world. Misa Rebaro Tipico was created as an affirmative action initiative with the intention of correcting the inequality and oppression that autistic people face and the gap in access to resources for Spanish-speaking autistic people. They work to empower Spanish-speaking autistic people and provide community support and resources for Spanish-speaking autistic people and their families. Again, so proud to present one of two awards for service to the self-advocacy movement to Mi Cerebro Atipico. Esta presentación se dará en español e inmediatamente luego en inglés. This presentation would be given first in Spanish and immediately after it would be given in English. El español es la lengua materna de 470 millones de personas y la segunda lengua de otros 100 millones de personas con una identidad lingüística aún más discriminada. La mayoría habitantes de países pobres y sin los servicios sociales más básicos para acceder a una vida mínimamente digna, incluso cuando no eres discapacitado. Esto significa alrededor de 50 millones de personas autistas que experimentamos un nivel de vulnerabilidad que las personas en el norte global difícilmente pueden imaginar. Esta vulnerabilidad Incluye la falta de acceso a la información y a la formación en materia de derechos humanos. Hablar inglés es un privilegio al que muy pocos de nosotros accedemos. Y por eso lo que ustedes llevan haciendo desde hace 40 años apenas comienza para la comunidad hispanohablante. Esa es la naturaleza de la desigualdad a la que nuestra comunidad se enfrenta. Con frecuencia, los detractores del movimiento de autodefensa autista usan la frase no hay dos autistas iguales para silenciarnos. No comprenden que nuestras diferencias, incluidos nuestros conflictos internos, son parte de lo que nos hace tan fuertes. Nuestra comunidad es como el poema Pedazos de arco iris del poeta indígena colombiano a Hugo Jamioy. Ese que dice, creí vuelto pedazos el arco iris. No, eran guacamayos colgados en las nubes. Somos un arco iris que a veces parece que se hace trizas y eso nos descorazona. Pero si miras con más cuidado, te puedes dar cuenta de que en realidad siempre hemos sido guacamayos colgados de las nubes. Somos una identidad colectiva que celebra y se nutre de las diferencias individuales. La comunidad autista se nutre de las propuestas, vivencias y reflexiones de miles de autistas diferentes, pero a todos nos motivan los valores de justicia, equidad y accesibilidad. A todos nos une la creencia terca de que un mundo mejor para todos los autistas y personas discapacitadas es posible. 
somos una comunidad porque a veces más tarde, a veces más temprano, porque todos tenemos procesos diferentes, siempre terminamos revisando nuestros propios privilegios para darle a los más vulnerables de entre nosotros el sitio que les corresponde en la mesa. Ese premio es evidencia de eso. A todos los defensores autistas que haciéndose conscientes de su privilegio angloparlante nos confiaron sus experiencias, reflexiones y labores emocionales para traducirlos y hacerlos accesibles a nuestra comunidad. Gracias por traicionar sus privilegios. A los padres que han asumido esta lucha pensando en sus hijos y que hoy usan sus privilegios neurotípicos para amplificar y proteger las voces de los adultos autistas. Les agradecemos su valentía para revisarse y su compromiso de convertirse en la red de apoyo a la que los autistas tenemos derecho. Y para todos y cada uno de los autistas hispanohablantes que se nutrieron de nuestro proyecto y decidieron apoyarlo, a los que nos dieron la oportunidad de revisarlo desde sus críticas y a los que están compartiendo hoy en día sus propias experiencias y esgrimen sus teclados como espadas para plantarle cara al capacitismo. Este premio también es suyo. En nombre de todo el equipo de Mi Cerebro Atípico, gracias a todos por ser nuestra comunidad. Spanish is the mother tongue of 470 million people and is the second language of other 100 million people with an even more discriminated linguistic identity. Most of them, people who live in poor countries and without the most basic social services to access a minimally dignified life, even if not disabled. That means that there are around 50 million autistic people who experiment a level of vulnerability that people in the global north can barely imagine. This vulnerability includes the lack of access to information and education in human rights. Speaking English is a privilege that very few of us have access to. And that's the reason why what you have been doing for the last 40 years is barely starting in the Spanish-speaking community. That is the nature of the inequality that our community faces. Often, detractors of the autistic self-advocacy movement say there are no two autistic people who are alike to silence us. They don't understand that our differences, including our internal conflicts, are part of what makes us so strong. Our community is like the poem, Pieces of Rainbow, by the indigenous Colombian poet Hugo Amioy, the one that says, I thought that it was broken to pieces the rainbow. No, it was mocos hanging from the clouds. We are a rainbow that at times seems to be shattering and that breaks our heart. But if you look carefully, you can realize that we have always been mocos hanging from the clouds. We are a collective identity that celebrates and nourishes from the individual differences. The autistic community nourishes from proposals, lived experience and reflections of thousands of different autistic people. But we are all moved by the human values of justice, equity and accessibility. We are brought together by the stubborn belief that a better world for all autistic and disabled people is possible. We are a community because sometimes later, sometimes sooner, because even if we all have different processes, we always end up checking our privileges to give the most vulnerable within us the place that they deserve at the table. And this award is evidence of that. To all the autistic self-advocates, 
that after becoming aware of their language privilege, entrusted us with their experiences, reflections, and emotional labor so we could translate them and make them accessible to our community. Thank you for being traitors of your privilege. To the parents that committed to this fight, thinking about their children and today use their neurotypical privilege to amplify and protect the voices of autistic adults, we thank you for being brave enough to question yourselves and commit to become the support network that the autistic people have a right to. And to each and every Spanish-speaking autistic that nourished from our project and decided to support it, to the ones that gave us the opportunity to examine it from their criticism, to the ones that are sharing their own experiences and wield your keyboards as swords against ableism. This award is also yours. From all the Miserebro Atipico team, thank you for being part of our community. I'm so excited to present the Harriet McBride Johnson Award for Nonfiction to Zach Budrick. Zach Budrick is a DC area journalist and crime novelist who covers environmental issues for The Hill. His writing has appeared in The Guardian, USA Today, and The Washington Post. He also co-hosts Stim for Stim, a relationship podcast by and for autistic people with Charlie Stern. Stim for Stim is an answer to some other media about relationships and autism. Um, that has less direction by autistic people, and I think it takes a much better approach. Um, Zach's work has highlighted the impact of environmental crises on disabled people and advocated better coverage and support for disabled people affected by these crises. So excited to pre present the Harriet McBride Johnson Award for Nonfiction to Zach Budrick. Hi everyone. To start with, this is an honor and a privilege and I thank you from the bottom of my heart. I know the popular image of an award speech from TV or whatever is to end with the thank yous, sometimes getting played off by the music, but in J school, they teach you the inverted pyramid where the most important information goes at the top, so I'm going to start with the thank yous instead. Thank you to the great folks at the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network for all the work they do. Thank you to the other autistic journalists it has been my honor to meet, many of whom have preceded me in this award, including Eric Garcia, Sarah Ludeman, and Dylan Matthews. A thank you to Harriet McBride Johnson, the namesake of this award. Thank you to Rachel, my wife, the love of my life, and someone whose love and grace and commitment to justice have informed my development as both a person and a journalist. Thank you to my dear friend and podcasting partner, Charlie Stern. Thank you to my work partner at The Hill, Rachel Friesen, and to my editors, Bob Cusack and Ian Swanson. Thank you as well to the rest of my colleagues and former colleagues at The Hill, including Rebecca, Harris, Marty, Lauren, Regina, Brett, Morgan, Joseph, Lexi, Marina, Ashley, and Celine. Thank you as well to the dear friends who have always encouraged me to tell both my story and others, and helped me understand that that's what I'm meant to do. I'm not going to use any last names because that's not something non-journalists have signed up for, but thank you to Alicia, Alan, Krista, Laramie, Meredith, and Jenna, the bravest person I know. And thank you to Caroline, who is no longer with us, but whose love and encouragement and bravery I feel in my life every day, and which gives me strength when I need it the most. Now, the other big difference between this and the Oscars telecast is that this organization has advocacy right in the name, so no one's going to get annoyed if I use some of my time to talk about the big issues. And they might, but that's probably more to do with me personally being annoying. So I'd like to say a little bit about the focus of my day job, environmental coverage, which was specifically mentioned when I was notified that I had that I was receiving the Harriet McBride Johnson Award. The effects of climate change are far beyond the theoretical at this point, particularly for those living in the global south, and they're only going to become more so even if we avert the worst case scenario, which it's my personal belief that we're more than capable of doing. And as is the case with so many other crises, disabled people are and will continue to be on the front lines. This is where nothing about us without us becomes so important because it's absolutely vital and non-negotiable that solutions to the crisis incorporate both the needs and voices of disabled people. When they don't, we get things like plastic straw bands. It's a random example, but it's the consequences of such a choice writ large. We'll both do nothing to stop the climate crisis and make life harder for the people most affected by it. 
So for anyone listening who might be in the position to actually affect these changes, I say to you, accessibility is not a perk or an option or an act of charity. Accessibility is a must because accessibility is survival. If it's not part of your solutions, they're not solutions. In conclusion, I'd like to zoom out just a bit. On Twitter, there's a question that comes up a lot. Uh, what would you tell an aspiring journalist or one just starting out? And a lot of the time, that gets a lot of snarky responses to just say, run or find something else to do with your life. I'm going to advise precisely the opposite, particularly for disabled and neurodivergent young people. One of the most important questions a journalist can ask of themselves while pursuing a story is, qui bono, who benefits? And you should specifically ask yourself, who benefits from your despair? Who benefits from your cynicism? Who benefits from the idea that it's impossible to make a meaningful change? And if you decide that you want to cede that ground to those people who benefit from that, that's your choice. But if the answer is no, you don't want to give them an inch, stick with journalism because it sounds like it's not done with you. And always bear in mind my other mantra for journalism, which is G-O-Y-A-K-O-D. Get off your butt, knock on doors. Thank you so much. Good night and God bless. I'm proud to present ASAN's Ally of the Year Award to Sandy Ho and the Disability and Intersectionality Summit. Sandy is a research project manager at the Community Living Policy Center, a student at the Heller School, the founder of the Disability and Intersectionality Summit, and a community organizer in the Boston area. She identifies as a queer disabled Asian American woman and her areas of interest include civic engagement of people with disabilities, access to Medicaid HCBS for people of color with disabilities, and building research capacity among disability advocates. The Disability and Intersectionality Summit aims to create dialogue on how our society must address systemic oppressions using an intersectional approach. It's a national conference centered on the multiple oppressions that shape the lives of disabled people. At the conference, the focus is on the experiences of multiply marginalized disabled people, as told by disabled people in a setting organized by disabled activists. The conference centers the experiences and the knowledge of multiply marginalized disabled people, such as queer disabled people of color, undocumented transgender disability disabled people, or formerly incarcerated disabled people, among many others. Our community has never seen something quite like the summit before, and it's a powerful locus for organizing, community building, and transformational change. We're so grateful to Sandy and all of the other organizers involved, and we can't wait to see what they do next. It is my great honor to present this award to them. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for this moment of joy and celebration. I am honored to be recognized as Ally of the Year by ASAN, an organization whose work and friendship has helped to make me a better ally. I'd like to begin with a crane story, because we are at an ASA and gala after all, and I'm a sucker for themed events. So in 2018, after the Disability and Intersectionality Summit ended, I flew from Boston to Chicago and boarded the California Zephyr train headed to San Francisco. So this crane took me through seven states, including going over the Mississippi River, through the Rocky Mountains, and up Donner Pass, before finally pulling into the Bay Area. For two and a half days, I got to see some of the most incredible views going by my window. And as I admired the landscape, my mind kept going back to one question. Where is my place in the disability community? It was really on that train where I began to think of myself as a builder. And it's not just because I also really happen to love Legos. But I've helped to build community spaces for conversation on disability and intersectionality. And I've also been privileged to build disability research in ways that connect self-advocates with policy researchers and policy makers. In all of this building, I have done my best to try and remember to ask questions about who is missing from policy discussion, who is missing from the data and evidence in disability policy research, and who is missing from the conversation on disability and intersectionality. The crane ride gave me the quiet and time to think more deeply about the work that needs to be done to ensure that fewer barriers exist that discriminate against self-advocates and disabled people in ways that 
prevent us from participating in society, prevent us from living it in settings of our own choosing, and prevent us from being represented by our democracy. Being a builder means putting allyship into action. Because an ally, after all, is more than a title and more than a label on an award. I practice allyship by helping to build what is possible. Getting back to the train for a minute, the California Zephyr train actually began its own journey back in 1949. And over the course of its history, experienced a lot of changes in its ownership and leadership, changes in the routes that it took, and even made changes in the types of crane cars that it used. Now, I personally believe that it is because the California Zephyr crane changed in response to the passengers and the industry that supported it that allows it to remain one of the most long-standing transcontinental crane routes today. Here's what I've learned as an ally to the autistic community. Allies help make change happen. We encourage it. We help make adjustments and support in ways that sometimes no one will ever even know about. And we recognize that cheering on the change that needs to happen is necessary because our disability community and self-advocacy movement is an incredible ride with some of the most amazing views. And more self-advocates and disabled people should come aboard with us in this adventure. All of us can be allies in this work. So I want to use my privilege and honor in accepting this award by calling upon all disability organizations, groups, leaders, members of our community to ask yourselves, who have you been building with? And will the things that we work on together allow more people to come aboard? Thank you so much for your time. And to my fellow ASAN community members, I look forward to building alongside with you very soon. We are excited for the chance to honor people and groups who are doing fantastic work. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We have more events coming up. We'll be starting the first night of film screening shortly, but first, some final remarks and reminders. Austin values your support and contributions. In this incredibly difficult year, we were so grateful that you're here celebrating with us. If you're in a place where you can, think about giving to Austin as we enter the holiday season. You can become a member to receive Austin gifts. You can also give the membership to an autistic friend or family member. The recipient will receive Austin merchandise and a members only newsletter. We're excited to have you join us for upcoming events this week. Tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern Time will be our panel discussion on racial disparities in public health. After that, we will continue our film screening at 5 p.m. Eastern Time. Check the program or the gala page on the Austin website for a complete list of events and times. Austin will also be posting event reminders on our Facebook. Twitter and Tumblr pages. If you can't attend at the times listed, almost all events will be archived on Austin's YouTube channel to watch at your convenience. The one exception for that is the film screenings today and tomorrow. View Austin's annual report for more information about the work that they have done this year. It's been a rough year, but the disability community is and will continue to fight. We're excited to have you all aboard. Advocacy is about bringing everyone with us. Thank you again for coming out and celebrating with us. Now let's begin the film screening, sponsored by Anthem. At this gala, we will be watching three films together, films that take important steps toward centering the perspectives of non-speaking autistic people. We will screen two short films today, and one tomorrow. There is no disability justice unless there is justice for its most vulnerable members. When you help the most vulnerable members, you ensure justice for all. This was highlighted as a principle of disability justice by Sins Invalid. In the autistic community, non-speakers fall into this marginalized and vulnerable community. First, we will be screening Listen. 
The runtime is 6 minutes. This documentary contains graphic descriptions of restraint and seclusion. It also includes conversations about disability-based discrimination and harassment. Listen is a short film made by and with non-speaking autistic people. To give you some background, in December 2020, the musician Sia publicly offered to fund Communication First to make an introductory short to her new movie, titled Music. The short was intended to help humanize and spread awareness about real non-speaking autistic people who were left out of music despite being the subject of the movie. After a team of non-speaking and autistic people reviewed music and provided feedback and recommendations to Sia on how to improve it, they received no response from her team. In early February 2021, Communication first decided to move forward to produce a self-funded short by and with real non-speaking autistic people and to launch it on February 12, 2021 the same day as the U.S. release of the film, Music. The film Listen is the result. Following Listen, we will screen people like me. The runtime is 20 minutes. This documentary includes conversations about and references to violence against children and radicalized violence. This film may be overstimulating to those with visual and auditory sensitivity. Created by Autism Campus Inclusion alum, Merrick Sedgwick, and partially filmed at the YACI program, People Like Me, challenges Western perspectives on autism that frame autistic people as solely in search of a cure, and applied behavior analysis YABA as the optimal and primary treatment for autism. People Like Me is an experimental essay film that challenges dominant perspectives about non-speaking autistic people. When non-speaking autistic people become the authors of their own words, through the use of augmentative and alternative communication, yay yay see, devices such as a letterboard, text-to-speech software, or the film camera itself, they paint a picture of a vibrant community struggling against repressive systems that would attempt to control everything they have to say. People like me is an assertion of the humanity of all and the rights of one of the more marginalized communities to be given the tools they deem necessary to participate fully. We acknowledge that the content in both films may be difficult to view, so we encourage you to prepare emotionally before proceeding. Take care of your safety and well-being.